Let's take a look at the study questions for Kant's What is Enlightenment? or an answer to the question, What is Enlightenment? Number one, what is Kant's definition of enlightenment? It's leaving our self imposed immaturity and uh, learning to use our reason without the guidance of another. I suppose that's, that's the answer to that question. Of course, it's contentious, right? I mean, the notion that our immaturity is self-imposed, that is, it's a, largely a, um, a fault of our own as individuals, that we're too willing to be led. We're too willing to have other people think for us, and we are reluctant to take the step into maturity and begin to think for ourselves. But I suppose that enlightenment is just the capacity, the, um, the ability and the actualized ability of actually doing it, to think for ourselves, to leave our self-imposed immaturity and think for ourselves without the guidance of another. That's key. Number two, why does Kant think that it is easier for an entire public to enlighten itself than for an individual to do so? Because the public, it's the exchange of ideas. Uh, that is key. Uh, and it's the influence of people who can think for themselves that will be the beneficial influence on us all to encourage us all to do the same thing. So if we were to be in isolation, uh, it would be very difficult to become enlightened. But in a group setting where we are exposed to the uh, ideas of others and have kind of uh, free discussion that actually stimulates thought and in which we are encouraged to think for ourselves, uh, it's easier in a social situation for a society as a whole to become enlightened. Number three, what is all that is needed for a public to enlighten itself? Freedom. The answer to that is freedom. But more specifically, the freedom to use public reason in all matters without any kind of hindrance or constraint. So. All that is needed for a public to enlighten itself is to have free speech. It doesn't mean that all speech is free or that there aren't any conditions under which speech is not free and should not be free, but that there's some place in society where there's the free exchange of ideas and that necessitates that people are willing, able, without fear of repercussion, to express their opinions. So as long as we have that, I think Kant says, we will, we will become more enlightened. Number four, what is the difference between the private and public use of reason? The public use of reason is the use of reason when we are addressing the public, the world at large, the reading public. The private use of reason is when we are addressing uh, some community which is not the public, which is a, a section of the community, and especially where our role in speaking is not as the scholar addressing the world, but as the representative of an institution committed to uphold the basic principles of that institution. So I guess he's thinking, you know, most prominently of a, of a clergy, clergy pastor, a person who's a representative of a religious institution of some kind. That would be the paradigmatic private use of reason where it, it can be limited in the freedom of what you can say because you are bound to uphold the basic principles, but that you can step out of that and become the scholar addressing the, uh, the world as a whole. But it's a different guise. It's a different role. Uh, number five, what according to Kant is the original destiny of human nature is to make progress in enlightenment. It's to get closer, I suppose, individually and collectively as a species to something like enlightenment, the gaining of truth, the gaining of uh, the ability to find truth for oneself through the free use of one's reason without reasoning under the guidance of another. That is the original destiny of human nature, so that anything that thwarts that, anything that stands in the way of the individual or the species reaching enlightenment, he says, would be a crime. Would be a crime against our very nature. Number six, what is the difference between an enlightened age and an age of enlightenment? An enlightened age would be the perfected uh, state of reaching, fulfilling enlightenment, which is a, a goal. Uh, whereas an age of enlightenment is an age where progress is being made towards that goal. So an, an enlightened age is probably impossible. 
because there will always be work to be done. But an age of enlightenment would be an age in which there is free speech, there is the the growth of knowledge, as Dante might say it, but uh, getting moving closer to something rather than having achieved it. Number seven, what is Kant suggesting at the end of the essay about the relation between, quote, the vocation to think freely and, quote, the principles of government is actually quite difficult. But I think what he's saying there is that uh, the need for free speech is not just for its own sake, it's for the sake of realizing a political goal. And that political goal is respect for the individual. So that um, eventually, and remember, he, he he's quite conservative about this, but eventually we will reach the point, if enlightenment proceeds further, in which individuals are able to govern themselves. They don't really need government once they become enlightened because they rule themselves as rational creatures. So eventually, I think Kant thinks that well, the, the, the vision is of a liberal society in which each individual is recognized as having inherent worth, but also having the capacity to make decisions for themselves and the respect for those decisions. So I think what he's thinking about is a truly free society and that, that eventually the exercise of the public use of reason will result in a, in a truly free society, which after all is what we all